On today's show, Laura Haywood interviews... Broadway legend and my personal idol, Julie <laughs> Halston. Welcome to Laura Haywood Interviews. I'm Laura Haywood. My guest today steals the show in Tootsie the Musical, playing Rita Marshall, the glam theater producer who puts down $12 million, none of it her own, into a musical starring an unknown woman named Dorothy Michaels, who, spoiler alert, not really, is actually a man named Michael Dorsey. She's a legitimate Broadway veteran, Julie Halston, that is, not Rita Marshall, with nine shows under her belt. Later, I'm going to quiz her to see if she can name them all. And she made her name as the muse for Charles Bush off-Broadway and downtown cult shows like Vampire Lesbians of Sodom, The Lady in Question, and The Divine Sister. She had an incredibly memorable role in Sex in the City as the socialite Bitsy Von Muffling and does the funniest stage show combining dramatic readings, old Hollywood comedian-style stand-up that are so engaging and hilarious that I've legitimately proposed producing a one-woman show called Julie Halston Reads the Phone Book in which Julie Halston literally just reads the phone book. She's also done remarkable Remarkable work raising money for the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, including her long-running annual gala, Broadway Belts for PFF, which now honors the memory of her dear husband, Ralph Howard, my former colleague at SiriusXM and the longtime voice of 1010 Wins in New York. She has a spark and spirit like no one I've ever met, a talent that lights up every room she's in, and a wit that ranks up there with the best in the world. Please welcome my dear friend, the icon, Julie Halston. Oh my goodness. I must be somebody. You my are somebody. Gosh. Oh, wow. You're well, basically who I want to be when I well, grow up. <laughs> thank you, darling. Um, you're fine just on your own, <laughs> I can tell you right now. Uh, but I am, as you said, I'm in Tootsie right now on Broadway, and we are having the, seriously, the most fun. I mean, there's, it's always fun to do a Broadway show, but Tootsie is very, very special because I, it is the funniest show I- I've seen in years, and I- I'm I'm in it, of course. <laughs> but I watch it from backstage a lot when I'm not in a scene, and I literally I know the script backwards and forwards. Now I am still laughing. You it's have incredible. one of those scene stealing roles where you're you're on stage um, for I, I don't know uh, maybe five or six numbers. Yeah, um, you have one big show stopping song yes yes um, and uh, but you you do have a lot of opportunity to watch the drama yes. unfold. oh yes because you know there's a lot with Michael Dorsey and his roommate and his friend Sandy Lester played by the brilliant Sarah Stiles oh and gosh. and of course he's you know falling in love with the character that Lily Cooper is uh, you got her name wrong it's Tony nominee Lily Cooper. Tony nominee <laughs> Lily Cooper who is absolutely stunning um so there's a lot of other scenes, mm-hmm. uh, but also his scenes with his agent, Mike McGraw. Another I mean, Tony winner. Another Tony winner and another scene stealer. Totally. Um, but you know what? Everyone in this show is amazing. Somebody actually said that they hadn't seen a show on Broadway that reminded them of the classic television show, The Mary Tyler Moore Show. Wow. Where every character was distinct and hilarious and worked in with this very Mm family-type situation. And I thought, what a great, smart analogy that is. Well, that's a very big compliment. It really is. When it comes to sort of laughs per minute, you don't get any better than than Mary Mary Tyler Tyler Moore. Moore. I mean, that's an iconic television show. And Robert Horn, our book writer, uh, you know, I say just give him the Tony right now. (laughs) Just etch it in. Wait, are you a voter? Uh, I'm not a voter. (laughs) I'm not a voter. Um, But it's the funniest book in years. And many people, you know, reviewers apparently have said that. It's yeah, the reviews have been excellent. Yeah. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about your character about Rita Marshall and who she is? Well, Rita Marshall is uh, one of those women. And you know, if you live on the east side, (laughs) particularly the Upper East Side, you might know these women. Uh, They have, you know, sort of platinum or silver hair. You know, she's a woman of a certain age. Their faces are lifted, as is mine. (laughs) And uh, they, you know, Botox regularly. Um, 
they wear incredible clothing, which, you know, William Ivy Long. Oh, the best. I mean, he has uh, made me a vision. Um, Julie, on stage. you're playing yourself. Well, you already are a vision. <laughs> oh, You've got platinum hair. You wear you you as you. I wasn't going to bring it up, but you mentioned the lifting of the face. Yes, um, yes. And you're. I mean, right now you're like head to toe gold, chic, sparkly. Well, like, I mean, I, well, I'm playing. I, let's I, just say I did some research and I found out there were were no auditions for this role. It no. was Julie Halston all the way. That is um, true. So. Forgive me if I if yes. I notice a few similarities. Okay, well, thank you, darling. But I mean, literally, women have stopped me on the street and saying, you know, said, "Where do I get that gold suit at the end? Where you wear that?" I said, "I said, darlings, it's vintage Dolce and Gabbana. You'll have to call. Is it really? It is, oh. and you'll have to call William Ivy Long. But until this show closes." Uh, you're not taking it off my back. Please tell me you put it in your contract that you got to keep your costumes. Um, I. I don't have that in my contract, however. <laughs> um, the, don't check the hangers too closely. Yeah. <laughs> and also these phenomenal gold pajamas that I wear for 30 seconds on stage. People literally are like, uh, you know, people in the building have coveted them. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm, I always tell my dresser, make sure those, those are hanging there, you know, every <laughs> night. But... Um, Anyway, Rita Marshall is one of those Upper East Side ladies. She's been married a few times. She's been lifted. She, she, um, she I suspect she started with some money, mm -hmm. and she kept marrying up. Um, she's divorced, and I think right now, in the midst of you know her meeting Dorothy Michaels, she might be single. Mm -hmm. But there may be another guy, you know, uh, uh, you know, because let's face it. Ultimately, she produces a show that's rather successful. Yes, she does. So, um... Well, wait. Do, does she? I mean, what happened? Well, I, yes. I mean, I, the, I think that the story of Tootsie is pretty well known. Yes. Um, although I actually haven't seen the movie since I was a little kid. Yes. And I purposefully didn't rewatch it before right. seeing the show because I wanted the show to stand alone. Right. So, in, in this situation, it's always a little weird. Like, do we talk about spoilers? Do we talk right. about how it right. ends? But... I just, in a very, like, without giving anything away, well, does the show ultimately succeed after the storyline we see on stage? Um, well, it's, it, let's put it this way. It keeps going. Uh -huh. And certainly when Dorothy Michaels is in the show, it has become, you know, a, a much better, a, a bit of a smash. So, uh, and, you know, the movie, I haven't seen the movie since I was older than you, but I haven't seen it in a long time. But I did actually watch some clips recently. Uh -huh. And uh, it was a very funny movie. But what I thought was fantastic, for example, it was one of those movies that really helped make Bill Murray a bigger star than he already was on Which part did he Saturday play? Night Live. He plays the role of the roommate. Ah, which Andy Grote Lucian is playing. I'm so glad you knew how to pronounce that. Yes, Grote Lucian. It has about 20 vowels in it. Yes, it's almost like, you know, Icelandic, you know. And but he's one of these guys who, like, trained in Shakespeare. He's, like, got this huge classical acting background. Um, I met him at Tony Nominee Press Day, and he yes. was like, what am I doing nominated for a musical? He, I think that he always imagined getting nominated for a Tony for playing, like... Yes, yeah. You know, you know Richard know. III. Exactly, exactly. And what's amazing is that... He is so effortless mm -hmm. in his portrayal of um, Jeff Slater, the, you know, the... Um, the one Bill Murray played. The, the one movie. Bill Murray played. And can I tell you the highest compliment in the world? Charles Bush was at the opening night party, and he was like, oh, my gosh, I loved all the characters. It was amazing. And who is this Andy Gurry? <laughs> couldn't even say. And I said, Grote Lucian. And he said, is he a professional actor? He thought, like, maybe we got him, like, <laughs> off the street. Because he plays a sort of schlubby guy. Schlubby, like, roommate guy. guy who doesn't really work too hard in life. Oh and he is so effortless. It's amazing. And um, did, Does Andy take that as a compliment? He did. He did, actually. <laughs> um, he's, 
you know, the thing about Andy is that he's he is a little like Jeff Slater. Mm -hmm. He actually wears flannel shirts a lot to the theater, and I'm like, is he in costume? <laughs> like, what's happening? People probably say that about you, too. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, they might. The um, big question is, does Santino come wearing a red glittery dress? <laughs> no, he does not. He does not. And I honestly don't know how Santino is still standing. I mean, that guy has to sing like Dorothy Michaels, sing like Michael Dorsey, dance and he's in almost every scene. Plus, I heard he has to shave like three times a day. Yes. <laughs> and I will tell you, those quick changes where he has to become Dorothy Michaels, mm -hmm. there were like six people on him. I bet. And it is a remarkable transformation. But then there's some quick changes that the character makes on stage. Yes. Where it's just him or just him and his roommate. Yes. And the choreography of how they're throwing clothing items and wigs and throwing earrings things and glasses the freezer and yes. like different doors are slamming. I mean, it's like somewhere between a vaudeville routine and like a WWE uh, yes, match event. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, a yeah, top yeah. Dance number. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. And you know, apparently, uh, I would say almost every couple of shows. Something goes a little awry, like an earring flies off, mm -hmm. or one night recently his glasses fell off, and mm -hmm. we watched them fly, and we never knew where yeah. they landed. And um, the audience, of course, loved it, you know, because they love it when anything goes a little kooky. Yeah, you never want anybody to get hurt, obviously, no. but to be reminded that it's live theater. It's live theater. There are certain shows that that play so long and the actors have done them so long that they it's almost like watching a movie because yeah. it's exactly the same and slow so slick and perfect which you'd think would be the goal but to me a little just the teeniest bit rough around the edges yep. so we can remember that you are actually there in the room it's happening this moment yeah. and and that you know it's not being filmed it's no more retakes or you know redos or anything like that it's happening right now you're witnessing it live right now but anyway, uh, what's amazing is that Santino is so quick on his feet. He knows how to make a quick little quippy remark and, you know, uh, you know, he's so good at it. And the audience just loves it. Mm -hmm. So we're all and, and one of the dancers finally found the, the, the glasses <laughs> and actually picked them up on stage and danced off with them and you know gave them to stage management uh, at least they didn't find them by the crunch under no, a heel no exactly so uh but we are having the time of our lives i mean we really are and dare i say it it sounds so like oh you know yes they all love each other they're <laughs> such a family um but there really there are no problems i mean there really are not you know, the, putting the show together was stressful mm -hmm. because f even four days before we opened, we were still changing things. Yeah, I went to the third preview and then I came back yesterday. So I would be it'd be really fresh in my mind for yes. a conversation. And there were a lot of changes. There were a lot of changes. And so uh, when we were in Chicago, we were running really long. Like three plus hours? Well, three hours. Uh -huh. And mm, that's not going to go here. Yeah, two it, and a half is standard. 245 is long. Is long. And, you know, I, we don't need to be doing King Lear, Tootsie. <laughs> it's Tootsie, the musical. <laughs> Glenda Jackson is Tootsie. It's Tootsie. <laughs> now, actually, that might be fun. Um, be hilarious. Yeah, can you Glenn imagine her as Tootsie? <laughs> Glenda Jackson as Santino Fontana, as, as Michael Dorsey, exactly. as Dorothy Michaels. It, it, it might have gotten her a Tony nom. I mean, if ooh, she played. ouch, Julie. Ouch, ouch, yes. Um, anyway, I don't think Glenda, I don't know, she might be upset, but I, I you know, she's Glenda Jackson. She got one last, last she's, year. She's Glenda Jackson. I think she's already iconic. I want her to play um, Glinda. Okay, that would Glenda be another as one. Glinda. That would be another <laughs> one. Popular. Popular. <laughs> I'm not popular. <laughs> 
Anyway, uh, anyway uh, we, we, this is how us theater nerds get yeah, to yeah, together is we just start riffing. It's and true. It's a, it's a yes and situation. We can get lost in a train of thought, but hopefully that's fun for the people listening at home. I hope so. Or they've turned off <laughs> yeah, already. Exactly. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, there are a lot of changes. We've tightened the show enormously. Uh, there was for a moment... There was another song that Lily was going to sing instead of Gone, 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 which is what she sings in the club. That was replaced, and then it went back to Gone, Gone, Gone. So, I mean, there's a lot of process here, and lots of tweaks, like this line is going to leave us, but then we're going to add another line, or these lines are leaving us, but one word is going to be put in place of this or whatever. So it's, and we have to go on every night for the preview period with these changes. Yeah. And so it's you, a you're little doing tricky. New pages every day. Every day. Uh, I bet sometimes new choreography yep. that goes along with oh, it. Oh, yes. Did, did your character have any of that stuff? I had the new line. There's, well, there were a few new lines. And also um, in Chicago, I. That's the city, not the musical. The city, not the musical. I wasn't really in um, the most important night the way I am now. Mm -hmm. So that changed, and that had to be re-choreographed. And then they added a costume for me, because every time you see Rita Marshall, she's in another glorious costume. God forbid she wear the same outfit Ex twice. twice. Um, and in the song... Uh, I like what she's doing. I change costumes within the song three times. Oh my so, gosh. Wow. Now I have to come back just to watch for that. Yeah. Yeah. I change my costume it, it, literally in one song three times. Wow. I go from this incredible bronze number to a blue number to a gold number all within one song. So it's really uh, fantastic. I but, feel like Vogue should do a shoot of just like Rita's costume. Uh, well, Vogue or Vanity Fair, you know, I'm, we're putting it out there. Yeah. I'm putting I mean, it out there. Hey, I'll put in a recommendation. Yeah, for there you, you go. Um, let's talk about the bits that you have when, when you're not center stage because you are doing such funny things that I think really speak to how talented you are and how committed you are as an actor. For example, the first scene where we meet Rita, she's sitting in on auditions for the character of Juliet's nurse. The, um, the show within a show is... Juliet's curse. That's what I meant to say? Yes. Um, the show within a show is called Juliet's Curse and uh, they're holding auditions for the character of the nurse. Yes. Um, uh, Sarah Stiles' character auditions and her... Wayward ex, uh, Michael Dorsey, sneaks into the audition dressed as his new alter ego, Dorothy Michaels. And um, they have to sing, all of the people auditioning have to sing a few bars of one of yes. the songs from yes. Juliet's Curse. Right. Um, you do this hilarious thing where you mouth all the words <laughs> to the audition because clearly the producer of the show right. knows what they're going to say next. Right, and right, she, right. So she, but you do it so subtly. Oh, well, that thank you, sweetheart. It doesn't. For a second, I was like, is Julie Halston mouthing the words or is Rita mouthing the words? But then I was like, Julie Halston would not mouth the words of her. I've seen shows. Right, right. Not on the Broadway level, but I've seen shows where other actors mouth their, yes. their co-stars. Oh, yeah, no, lines. I know. It's, oh, it's so bizarre. But, but yeah. that made it extra strong when a few minutes later, when or maybe actually I guess it's in a different scene, where they go off script and and Rita is suddenly like so confused yes. and you play confused in such a uh, visceral way that well thank you that just had me giggling even though the lines weren't yours right and it's this magic middle ground and i wonder whether you whether this is a skill or whether this is just an instinct but you don't steal the attention from the people who are center stage right and yet if anybody glances at you it's like you tell a whole story with a little twitch of your head or like how do you walk that line of not yeah refocusing the audience member but still being this physical comedian that you are well that is i mean and this is where scott ellis is really kind of brilliant because and i've worked with scott before and he knows that you know as he's literally said to me, um, you know, Julie, we know you can steal a scene. You're, I don't want you to steal any scenes here. You have to be in the scene. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what an actor really has to be. It has to be she or he has to be present. You are actually, you know, because I sort of grew up in the Charles Bush tradition Mm -hmm. where everything was very presentational, where we barely looked at each other. This is very different. I actually have to look at my fellow performers on the stage, and we are reacting to each other. The fact is, when those girls come in for that audition, I do know the song. I'm trying to go along with them. They're not very good. Mm -hmm. And that's when I sort of slide their resumes over to the (laughs) side of my table. Because, but I also want to be encouraging to them. So I'm going to try to smile to them because that's what people do in auditions. I've been there so many times. You know, and you also know that that being a woman in the business is really hard. Terribly and, tough. Uh, terribly tough. And, and we've got a male director who's very opinionated. Oh my gosh, I like I love Red Rogers as an actor, but as a character, he was like that character is the it's the closest thing I think the show has to a villain. Yeah. He basically plays the character of toxic masculinity. Yes, yes. But he's, of course, hilarious. Yeah, of course. Hilarious, it's a, but... It's a caricature. A character, but um, at the same time, you know, he's obnoxious. And he, you know, doesn't take these girls seriously. And um, anyway, it. Thank you for mentioning that. And when I... I remember when the scene when Santino and I are in the dressing room together in act two, you know, it was really Scott Ellis who said, you know, really be there for each other. Just really look at each other and react, you know, and to these, to the circumstances and to each other. And that is what being present is all about. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I'm glad that you noticed that. And I'm delighted that you would see that. But at the other, at the same time, We also have to keep the focus on the story. What is the story being told? The story being told is that these girls are coming in for an audition or Santino's character is trying to push her way through the audition so that Ron Carlyle, the director, will take notice of her and let her actually sing. Um, So all that is, is part of it. You know, what I find fascinating is that Robert Horn, our book writer, has managed to keep all the elements of the beloved Tootsie story, and yet it's updated, it's today. Yeah, they're like ta- taking out their iPhones. And they're taking out their iPhones. They're, you know... Um, there are references to political things going on. I- in, in exactly. World. I mean, it's, it's definitely, definitely current. current. And the character of Julie Nichols, played by the, the wonderful Lily Cooper, Tony nominated <laughs> Lily Cooper. Um, For the rest of her life, she, yes, she earned it. Yes. There's only one way that title gets changed, and we'll find out on June 9th. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, is She's definitely a strong girl. This is no victim. This is not a damaged person. Mm-hmm. Uh, as, as lovely and wonderful as Jessica Lange was in the movie, that character would really not stand up today, I don't think, under the scrutiny of what has gone on. Uh, She was a very damaged person who was sort of sleeping with a director that she didn't really want to be with. You know what I mean? It it was too uh, difficult. Right. So, um, no, this this Julie Nichols is a strong gal who... She's playing politic a little bit. Like yeah. She's trying to be polite. And, yes. And, you know, she because she wants to keep her job. And that is so, so relevant. I mean, like, yes. like we've said numerous times, this show is laugh out loud funny. It's, it's so very much a musical comedy in the tradition of the great musical comedy. Exactly. And yet there can be these moments where you identify with the characters like, oh, God, like that... That hits close to home, yes, and yet it gives us a way to laugh at it, which provides some some release. And it's I do cathartic. think one of the things that people have said is when they leave the theater, they were so happy to laugh for two and a half hours mm-hmm. and not have a care in the world because we live in a very stressful time. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think rather refreshing and rather wonderful doesn't mean we're in denial about the world obviously not but 
to really be able to focus on this wonderful story and really laugh out loud and feel good is great. Isn't that just the epitome of suspension of disbelief? You're not just suspending disbelief about who these people standing on the stage in front of you are, but for a second, for two and a half hours, actually, you can suspend disbelief about the fact that the world's going to hell in a handbag. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) So, um, yeah, no, but, you know, we're uh, very current, and they address a lot of the issues And, of course, Michael Dorsey has to address the issue of what it is to be a woman. Mm -hmm. And he has to go through his own catharsis. And he does. And, you know, at one point, Julie really calls him out on it in very strong terms. And he has to respond, you know. And he has to really own his um, mistake. He has to own his mistake. So that's important. I think you could watch this as uh, as a, a political statement as much as you can uh, You can opt out of that if you want to. Yes. Like, there are going to be people who come because they're like, do it in a dress. That's right. funny. Right. Which, you know, I think everyone would admit is kind of a, a an antiquated uh, right. and Convention. sort of cheap way of getting a laugh. Yes. But this is not that. This no. is This is not we're going to put a man in a dress and laugh at that because I think, I don't know about you, but I know some men who wear dresses and there's nothing funny about it. No, not at all. Absolutely. Um, And And laughing at them would not be appropriate. No. Um, But, but this is, it's about the journey that, that an actor goes on. It's about, it's a story about someone who has been dreaming the same dream their whole life, who will do anything to get it. And, and has a, makes a questionable judgment um, and learn some important lessons along yes. the way, yes. which doesn't necessarily sound like the description of a comedy, and yet I, it is. my abs hurt today yes. because I was laughing so yes. much. And, and that really is what it is. It's that this guy has a dream. He doesn't really know what to do anymore. He has tried and tried the conventional way, and now he's going to take a different turn. And what, of course, is crazy is that it worked. It worked for a while, yeah. anyway. So, well, he just he said, uh, there's a scene where they reference the fact that he has just uh, celebrated his 40th birthday. That's right, and that's a big. That is one of those ages. You, you're telling me yes. I celebrated my 40th birthday just uh, eight days ago, and so I know what it feels like to yes. be like, wait, what's the rest of my life going to look like, especially when you've when you've imagined your life a certain way. Yes. You know, to get a little personal, like in the same way that Michael Dorsey assumed he would be, uh, you know, a successful actor doing Midsummer with Meryl in the right. park. Right, yes. Um, by the time he was 40, I always assumed that I'd be married with children by the time I was 40. I envisioned my, uh, you know, the second half of my, you know, 80-year, yes. <laughs> presumably 80-year-long life as being dedicated to raising a family. Right. And, um, right. you know, I've been very career-focused, and I have, you know, s- so many other things going on in my life that there are moments, and especially leading up to my birthday, where I where I thought, well, what in the world am, am I going to do? Oh, yes. And uh, so... Well, you start looking at the road very differently, particularly for women, because, you know, biologically, 40 is one of those dates where you kind of go, um, the children thing may not be happening. Or not in the way that I, you know, the the way that my parents did it. Exactly. But I think that, that being a performer, that same thing can happen. It's not biological, but it's societal. And I think that... You know, Michael Dorsey is the kind of guy who he is handsome enough to play the leading man. There's even like a sly, subtle nod to Santino's uh, previous role as the prince in Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, he's but but when those leading men types hit 40, I mean, not as much as the leading women types who right, hit 40 who are, and are su- and suddenly, well, like our age, are suddenly cast as the grandma. Yes, but, exactly. But I can see the parallels between hitting a marker like that and being like, I'll never be cast as Prince Charming. Right. Not anymore. And here's the other problem with Michael Dorsey. I mean, 40-year-old guy, not getting work, being told how difficult he is, which he is difficult, because yeah. he's very much a perfectionist. 
he's still living with a roommate in a crappy apartment. I mean, that's not where you want to be at 40. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, it's it, he's really in a crisis. I just wish he'd given it a little more time. Like, <laughs> I just, I don't know. I mean, there'd be no show if he didn't. There'd be no show, <laughs> be, darling. I, but for, for, I, have, I have friends who are like, what do I got to do here? Yes. And, and I don't want them getting any ideas. Oh, I know. I know. <laughs> but I know. you know what you have, have taught me? And when I say, like, you're who I want to be when I grow up, I don't mean that I want to be Julie Halston because you have done it better than I can ever do it. Oh. Plus, I truly believe the world needs a me. And when they do. I have a lot of people saying they want to be me when, when, Correct when they grow up. And I always say, no, no, it's not no, you don't. I mean, it's... It, you can't always believe everything, you know, that the social media is a full picture of somebody. That's right. But, but also, my, I mean, my life's pretty great. Yes. Uh, but the world needs every single one of us. Yep. What I will say is the reason that I say I, quote, unquote, want to be Julie Halston when I grow up is that you have shown me the importance of making my own work mm. and not waiting for the audition to come along or the director to come along or, in my case, the radio show to come along right. or, you know, the consulting gig or whatever, that, that the important thing is being creative and making something with the resources and the people on hand in the moment, that if you wait for the circumstances to be perfect, nothing will ever happen. Well, that's why for a long time, and this is actually a very good segue because it's how I spent quite a few years with my husband, Ralph Howard, uh, the broadcaster. I would get, uh, you know, uh, Charles Bush and I, and a number of other people started our own theater company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was in my late 20s. And it was very successful for like seven years. We did a lot of off-Broadway shows that became very seminal influences in the off-Broadway scene. However, you know, that was rough. You know, you can't really live on off-Broadway salary. Yeah, you and can be celebrated and still not know where your next salad's coming exactly. from. Exactly. Um, and also, you know, being part of a company is difficult. And we were a, a wonderful, amazing company, but we also lost a number of our key company members to the AIDS crisis. Yeah. And that was heartbreaking and, and terrifying. And ultimately, you know, we disbanded as a theater company. Uh, well, you know, you don't just disband your theater company and then just go... Well, I guess I'll just do Anything Goes next with Sutton Broadway, Foster, yeah. you know, on Broadway. I had to really work my way uptown, as it were, from, you know, the Lower East Side to the, to the West Side to, you know, the Roundabout mm -hmm. to, you know, other Broadway things. But in the meantime, very much like what you have done and learned from is I created my own shows. I created my own one-woman show. That did go off Broadway, but I started in the cabarets, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and you've won like a bunch of Mac awards, a lot right? of Mac awards, and um, you know, uh, I met an incredible array of people that I would not have known if I just stayed in the theater world, right. like Jim Caruso from Barrett Land and Billy Stretch, mm -hmm. the great Billy Stretch. And Liza Minnelli. And yeah, just your old friend Liza. My old friend Liza. Wait, was, did you once tell me a story about going backstage to Barbara Streisand? Oh, yes. Wait, oh, my, well, I went. I, well, it's a long story. I don't know if I can tell the whole thing, but Liza called me at home. Okay, first of all, how about that sentence? Julie. Liza called me at home. It's Liza. It, yes. Come see Barbara with me. That's kind of what she said. Um, and I was like, when? And she was like, tonight. And um, it was so crazy. And I called Ralph at the radio station. And I was like, Ralph, get your tux out. We're going to see Barbara Streisand. And he goes, I I'm on the air, you know. <laughs> and I was like, well, later tonight, later tonight. Um, it was so kooky crazy. Um, I had nothing to wear. I literally called my best friend in the whole world, who's still my best friend in the whole world, Charles Schoonmaker, who is a four-time Emmy Award-winning costume designer. And he was at the soap operas at that point. 
and uh, he literally sent over uh, like a big rack of clothes to my doorman. <sighs> You know, it was very, it that was very the glam. Life. It's the life. And I had, I, I had a gay SWAT team put me together, <laughs> which is still going on today, the gay SWAT team. And I had a, you know, my hairdress, I had to come over and, you know, makeup and all that. And uh, the, the, the funniest image is Ralph and myself literally waiting for Liza Minnelli at the will call at Madison Square Garden. I mean, you haven't lived until you've been surrounded by, you know, like a hundred people screaming, Liza, Liza, oh, Liza. That sounds scary. At the will call. It was so crazy. And then security people like ushering us in. And it was so nuts. And um, that's New York. Yeah, baby. yeah, yeah. It was fantastic, though. But it's a long, long story, which, um, you know, I can tell. That's that's a pretty that's. That's a pretty good story. That's in itself. a good. That's a pretty good story in itself. Anyway, at the very end of the evening, though, we all went backstage and we met, you know, her divinity herself. And um, at that point, you know, I think the Calder mobile that mobile that was in my hair <laughs> was like falling and like my makeup was smudging, and um, I knew I had to go home because I was starting to look like I don't know. Just it was sad. It was like Britney Spears, like when she was doing her no. breakdown days. You know, I mean, it was sad. But anyway, this was the this was what was backstage. Peter Jennings, the broadcaster, Billy Stretch, Jim Caruso, um, Fran Drescher, and Madeline Albright, and me. <laughs> and I was like, what? life am I leading and this I mean, was pre like social media so you couldn't even grab a selfie no no <laughs> but that is royalty right there it I was mean, it was crazy Julie Halston you are New York City royalty it was crazy you, I mean that was like a Bitsy Von Muffling moment it really was <laughs> and 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 then you know of course we're meeting with Barbara and did you call her Babs no I I but it was very interesting because she's you know she's very gracious very lovely her 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 uh, her nails are amazing you know she she really does have those iconic hands and nails or whatever but it was so fascinating she she was very polite she said hello you know but oh she lit up when she met my husband and i thought are you going after my man barbara <laughs> Get out of here. Well, I can say from personal experience, Ralph is very charming. He was very and charming. he knows how to, like... Oh, yes. He knows how to charm the ladies. Charm the ladies. He was, yes, 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 yes. But I'll tell you, we laughed all the way home, and we were just like, wow, what did we just experience? This was the first Barbra Streisand farewell tour. I think she's had, like, six of them now. Yeah, you know? I, I mean, like, I think everybody has. I think that... The, the Who has had a bunch. The Eagles, the have, Share, yeah, the, they're yes. all on. They're all on their farewell to the farewell tours. Tours. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, at a certain point, you go farewell. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but you know what? Let's. I don't want to encourage Share to stop touring anytime no. soon. Or Barbara. I've no. never seen Barbara perform live. Oh, it's it's pretty it's pretty special. I have well, next to time Liza calls. You. That's right. You exactly. need a plus one. Exactly. You know who to call. Exactly. So there we have that. So you were talking, I totally, totally like pulled you off course. You were talking about how important it, it was to, to do theater, but to also do stuff outside of Exactly. The and I created this show, um, these cabaret shows. And I, I have to say, it was so, uh, dare I use the word empowering, but it was. And also uh, to meet all these different cabaret performers, not only Billy and Jim, but Anne Hampton Calloway and, of course, Liza. But because um, Liza would, you know, sort of go to the clubs a lot. But it was a new genre. Julie Gold and I got to be friendly. Mm -hmm. And we did shows together. I got to just meet so many wonderful people, musicians. And, uh, and that led to teaching people and coaching people. And that was great as well. So, you know, it became a thing. And then what was fantastic was I, I added another skill to the skill set. Mm -hmm. And doing my own one-woman shows really helped me when I did perform in a play. It gave me so much confidence so that I could walk on that stage and know I could really land it really own it it polished my comedic skills when you have to do and and I have to say it was very gratifying uh, at one point I was doing a show 
a one-woman show. And Scott Ellis told me that he saw my one-woman show down at 88s. Wait, which he was... just, he told you this during the run of Tootsie? No, no, no. He had told me that this uh, a number of years ago that he had seen, he, he had heard about this very funny girl doing this cabaret show at 88s. You're kind of like the real life Mrs. Maisel. I... I, I was going to bring it up, but I, I, I decided against it. I mean, have, yes. you have a lot in common with, uh, it's true. with her. It's I, true. I really do. And I was also a housewife uh-huh. on a certain level with Ralph and a stepmom to his children. But I was doing this stand-up. Yeah. And Scott Ellis actually came and a, a, a lot of uh, casting agents actually came that were in the theater because I did a show at 88's, which was down on 10th Street, and I did it on, I believe, Wednesday nights and Saturday nights. And uh, uh, the first show I ever did there was called Julie Halston, I'll Be the Judge of That. <laughs> and, and then what happened is it got very, very successful. So I would sort of fine-tune the act. And, uh, oh, I had another one, you know, something like Julie Halston, Critical Care. Uh, you know, just it, it, I would change the titles, but it would be a similar act. But I would... Mix it up. Yeah. And I learned how to do things quickly. I learned how to have tremendous confidence in just performing without other people. Also, you have to be quick on your feet. Um, well, the best reactions to reading things out loud, uh, like, and, like uh, reading from the newspaper. This is where I, like, I was not joking in the intro when I said I want to produce a one woman show called Julie Halston Reads the Phone Book, where we get you like an old school yellow pages. They still print the yellow pages. Yes, they do. And I'm not talking about reading like all the names of people named Smith. Right. I'm talking about reading the ads like for the pizza places and yes. the plumbers and all of the other places that are still advertising in the yellow pages. Yes. I just think people would pay to watch you and the facial expressions you make well i i have thought about it and maybe at some point in because at some point in the summer i am going to be doing another new one woman show and uh you know i have thought of that i mean one of the things i love is you know the names that people come up with for their pizza parlor or their (laughs) hair salon or their unisex oh, the something, you know. Yeah, I mean. I did already reserve the Twitter account at Julie Phonebook. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so, All right. So that's ready to go. My gift to you. Oh, Should I you love it. I project. love it. So, yes. And, and, and that all started when I was doing Vampire Lesbians of Sodom with Charles Bush. I used to read the wedding announcements from the New York Times. And this is when they really were very, very staid and very, you know, they've expanded their who can get into the New York Times wedding announcements. You know, for years, it really was just the, dare we say, the white landed gentry. It was the Bitsy Von Mufflings. It was Bitsy Von Mufflings and, you know, her descendants. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it was like Wasp Central. Wasp Central. And, you know, I couldn't believe that they would put these things into, you know, and he went to Harvard and and his first marriage ended in divorce and what she wore and, oh, the veils. I mean, they took this stuff very seriously. And, you know, she's keeping her name and blah, blah, blah. Oh, my God. Anyway, I just thought it was ludicrous. But, uh, of course, once I had my own wedding announcement in the New York Times, I didn't think it was so ludicrous. But, um, anyway, I would read them when we were in the green room at Vampire Lesbians of Sodom. And it was really the the troop that said, you know, Halston, you... And it was Charles Bush who really booked me at 88. He said, you should be doing an act. Mm -hmm. And I was terrified to do it. But he booked me, unbeknownst to me. That is like an episode of Mrs. Maisel. It was an episode of Mrs. Maisel. Gosh, I want them so much to do a flash forward episode to like now and have you oh, that would be, be playing. Oh, that would, that's the, like, very inspiring. Well, you'll have to call day. Amy Palantino. I'll, yeah, I'll just get on the phone. Just get on the I phone. I think she'll the take your call. No. I don't know if she'll take mine. <laughs> uh, how did you and Ralph meet? He interviewed me. Uh, for 1010 10 wins. For 1010 10 wins. Well, you know, he used to do entertainment spots mm-hmm. on the weekends. And, um, you know, again, this was all through the cabaret world. But at that point, Sam Rudy, the publicist, who I still work with, um, Sam 
was the publicist for our theater company. But I was doing a one-woman show around the block from where we were performing, where Charles Bush's shows were performing. And I would literally take one wig off and stick another wig on and run around the block to 88s and do my one-woman show. So, you know, it would be kind of like on my night off or, or late night. And mm-hmm. the Daily News picked up on it. And uh, they did a story about this, you know, crazy actor, <laughs> off-Broadway actress who does two shows in a night or that kind of thing. And um, Sam Rudy said, oh, this is a great angle for both your show yeah. and the show with Charles. And he called Ralph Howard and said, hey, I, I'm going to pitch you this, you know, story. And uh, Ralph came to see the Charles Bush show. Was this Vampire Lesbians of Sodom? No, this was Red Scare on Sunset, which was all about the McCarthy era, Mm -hmm. which was very relevant today, actually. Oh, my gosh, I know. Yeah. So, and then then he also came to see my show, my one-woman show. And he said to Sam, oh, she's really funny. She's really funny. Yeah, let's, let's book her on the show. I was exhausted. I, I didn't know who this Ralph Howard was. I, I did listen to 1010 Wins. And what a I, voice. Yes, that voice. And I do actually remember listening to him when he was on WCBS as well. But, you know, I was, I was like, oh, I don't know what this is about. And it was Charles Bush who said, oh, I, I've been interviewed by Ralph Howard. I think you better go to that interview, Julie. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, He's really cute, and he's straight. Uh, He might be married. I don't know, but I I think you better go to that interview. Because at that point, I was divorced and, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of looking. Uh, Not super looking, but uh, open, open to suggestion. Um, And uh, I went, and he did open the door. And I could tell he was straight because he had sort of mismatched clothes. (laughs) He, he was he, he he was absolutely adorable, but he did have some mismatched things, like the tie oh, was Ralph. askew or whatever. Um, but you know, because you knew my husband, he was incredibly charming. He was a terrific broadcaster. He was very uh, captivating. Yeah, You're very captivating. And I could tell that Sam Rudy, the publicist, was like, "Julie, you're supposed to be funny," because I was going like. Um, well, you know, uh, you I, suddenly, I suddenly became a little girlish and, you know, like, oh, well, um, well, you know, I don't know. I guess I'm funny. You know, I was just like suddenly becoming like, and, you know, Sam was like, hey, you're here to book your, you know, to <laughs> you're sell not selling you. any tickets. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you're, <laughs> you're selling yourself, but you got to sell the show, kid. Anyway, um, the fact is, I said to Sam, I said, oh, he's really cute. Find out his story. And. Sam found out that he was single, and Sam went to Ralph and said, Hey, would you be interested? You know, it was kind of set up, you know. I know Sam. I wonder if he could find me a man. Well, yeah, you <laughs> might. Yeah, that's an idea. He's a publicist for Hamilton now. That's right. I mean. That's right. So he would, may have an idea. Maybe so anyway, it, it worked. There. It worked. Well, you had one of the most enviable uh, partnerships in New York City. I mean, I was on the just the most... I'm so grateful to have been on both sides of that because I know you through your performing. I knew Ralph and all of his colleagues at Sirius XM. I actually had separate relationships with both of you. Yes. Um, and uh, and so to to see at his memorial the the entire New York entertainment community come out to celebrate him, overflow seating in this beautiful was it is it do you call that a chapel? It's the Riverside Chapel, and yes, it's it's extraordinary it's just beautiful and they did an incredible job they were incredibly accommodating we did rent a piano because I wanted Billy Stritch you know Ralph really was insistent about what he wanted Mm -hmm. he wanted performers he wanted people that meant a lot to him and you know, he knew Billy Stritch and Jim Caruso before he actually met me. That's so crazy. You guys had all of these crossovers. Yes. And and uh, Julie Gold played 
uh, from a distance, from a distance, which people think is a Bette Midler song, but it's actually a Julie Gold song. That's right, and um, uh, he loved Julie, and he loved her singing from a distance. And his favorite Sondheim song was "Being Alive." Mm-hmm. And when we told <laughs> that to to Billy, he was like, "How is this going to go at a memorial service?" And he built it so beautifully. And you know, name dropping here because I worked with her and I also adore her and revere her, but. Bernadette Peters, you know, was at the service, and she said, she said, that was one of the most beautiful renditions of being alive I've ever heard. And um, Jim Caruso set the tone. He was both moving and funny, and um, some of Ralph's children spoke. And we got to hear that mellifluous, fantastic, wonderful, clear voice because my neighbor had been collecting tapes and CDs of Ralph's whole career since like 1962 to his time with, you know, Sirius XM with Howard Stern and put together that extraordinary tape. So I listen to it a lot. I bet. I really do. Um, Obviously, I miss him every day, but I will tell you that voice really uh, is great. And when we opened in Tootsie recently on March 29th, I didn't know, like, how that was going to go. This is the first show that Ralph isn't seeing me, you know. Uh, And he would have loved Tootsie. I mean, he just would have howled. But um, I woke up that morning, and I thought, hmm, how's how's this going to go? And I got very sad. Very, very sad. And, but I got to the dressing room, and I have pictures, you know, all all over my dressing room table. And I suddenly wasn't sad. I just said, you're going to get out there, kid. This is exactly the gift that he wanted for you. And I really just concentrated. And the cast is so wonderful and so supportive. Scott, the producers have been amazing. Carol Feynman, one of our lead producers, knew Ralph because she was a publicist for years. Oh my gosh. For the public theater. She knew. Okay. She knew. So anyway, it worked out. Um, I will say that I actually attended one of your opening nights as Ralph's date. Yes. Um, with your permission, of course. Yes. Um, you were on stage in, in you, you Can't Take t- It With You. Correct. And I don't know, I don't remember whether Ralph invited me or if I invited myself. Didn't <laughs> matter. I think I'm, I always made it clear to the both of you that if he ever needed a, a blonde on his arm and you weren't available. That, that was, I was fine and it was great. Along. And so I can tell you firsthand from experience Ralph watching you on stage oh. was, he he was like a little boy in love for the first time. Oh, God. And wow. you never got to see him I never saw watch that. you perform. Yeah. But I saw him watch you perform. Oh. And I just, I know he's watching you. Julie. Oh, he's beaming. And I know what his face looks like because I've seen that face. Yeah, the beaming, the beaming leprechaun. Yeah, <laughs> that 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 was the glint in the eyes. So, so I want I close out every show with a segment I call "Just Cause." We're just going to have one last segment, "Just Cause," just cause. which is a play on words because we're going to talk about a good cause. Ah. We're going to talk about doing good in the world. I say, what's the good of having a platform if you're not using it to change the world for the better? I completely agree. Speaking of Ralph's memory, not only will he live on forever because his voice is so beautifully captured in so many places and in his children and grandchildren and great grandchildren. And at the Paley Center for Media Studies. That's right. We've got, we can, we can actually hear and see, uh, you know, um, you know, pieces of his career, yes. but also you and Ralph together raised so much money and awareness for the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, an annual gala called Broadway Belts for PFF. I've been to six or seven of them. How yes. many have there been now? Ten? Nine. Nine. And then, so next year will be ten. So oh it's a gosh. big, big year. Yeah. And uh, we have raised, oh, I don't really know what the final figure is right now, but I mean, it's over, it's like maybe a couple of million. Yeah. Um But it's really become now, in really nine short years, a true Broadway New York institution. We do it at the Edison Ballroom. Um, And this is like a multi-course meal, champagne and wine and desserts and and just 
the incredible star power performances. The entire company of Hairspray reunited yes. last year. Yes, um, because Margot Lyon, our lead producer of Hairspray, developed pulmonary fibrosis. And she now has a lung transplant and is alive and well. So it was really an extraordinary event. But we've had David Diggs. Mm -hmm. We've had... Um, cast members from Hamilton. We've had Stephanie J. Block. We've had Anna Lee Ashford. We've had Brad Oscar. We've had Stephanie Mills. We've had Linda Lavin. We had Liza Minnelli. I mean, we get... Joel Gray. Joel Andrew Gray. Reynolds. Andrew Reynolds. I mean, we get Patty the Murin. stars. Patty Murin, Bob, Robert oh, Creighton. Oh, Bobby Creighton's there every year. Because his mom passed away from pulmonary fibrosis. This is... I, I don't remember ever having heard of it before the first one of your events I went to. Uh, we never did I either. I sat with Ralph, and I think it's fine for me to confess this now. Um, you had told him and told me he was not allowed to drink that night. Oh, yes. But he was sneaking up. Oh, I, he always did. He always did at the Edison And I Ballroom. wasn't sure where who my loyalty lay with, but I no, promised no. him I wouldn't tell. I no, think he'd be okay with right. it. I think the statute of limitations is passed. On yes, I think so. Um, Julie, in your honor and in Ralph's honor, I'm going to make a donation today to the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, pulmonaryfibrosis.org. I believe that every drop in the bucket helps, and hopefully my drop will inspire everyone else Else listening to put a few dollars in that into that bucket we can save lives ralph lasted an additional was it eight, eight years, years after his lung transplant and we traveled all over the world he saw the birth of great grandchildren he walked his daughter Lindsay down that aisle it was an incredible eight years miraculous so, so please join me in making a donation at pulmonaryfibrosis.org today julie halston thank you i really cannot tell you enough how much i love you how much i admire you uh how much I am inspired by you on a daily basis. How much time I would like to spend with you if, if I didn't fear that you were just going to get sick of having me around no. all the time. We love you um, on Broadway, by the way, um, darling. You're our Broadway girl, so oh, we love you. Thank you, Julie. Yes. Um, so uh, I want to remind people who are listening on the free podcast version today that um, you can get every episode a week early by making a small contribution at dnrstudios.com slash Laura. That lets me help keep making the show. So check it out. And um, lots of great stuff coming up for Tony season. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.